Shall we go on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Jyoti? Can you introduce him? Dr. Yes, right. So we come to the uh, last speaker for the session, and it's been a great feast for all, I guess, all of us also, and definitely for the postgraduates. I want to uh, invite Dr. Arul Selvan, who's a consultant neurologist from KMCH, a leading multi speciality hospital of Coimbatore, with an extensive exposure to top leading neurology centers of the world. And he'll be talking on a relevant topic of electrophysiology and neuro ophthalmology. Over to you, sir. Good evening. Many thanks for uh, the opportunity. I've given the opportunity by Dr. Ram, Chitra Ramamurthy and also Dr. Murali. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. So I'll, this is a huge task for me to finish the electrophysiology in your ophthalmology in 10 minutes. I'll try to do the justification. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the visual level potentials. And then the second one is the effective nerve conduction study. And the third one is single fiber EMG. The visual level potential is the volume of impulses which are generated from the, from the retinal nerve fiber and then carries through the optic nerve, optic chiasm, and optic tract, and then ended in the optic radiation. It is a summation of action potentials. Volume of impulses are generated from this layer and could be recorded at the occipital cortex. It is similar to the other potentials which we record, like somatosensory work potentials from the median nerve. Brainstem auditory work potentials from the vestibular cochlear apparatus. So, VEPs are the most common diagnostic pathway in the anti revision pathway. The electroretinogram is useful in the retinal disorder, which I'm going to discuss today. See, the volume of impulses usually generate from the nerve fiber layer of the retina. This is the thing, layers of the retina. And then the volume of potentials from the median cell taken from the nerve fiber layer. Nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, and further on in the optic radiation. The VEP tests the function of the visual pathway from the retina to the occipital cortex. It assesses the integrity of the visual pathway from the optic tract and then follows all the way up to the optic radiation in the occipital cortex. We all know that the temporal hemifield has been represented by the contralateral cortex in the occipital lobe and then left hemifield in the right optical cortex. The macula is represented in the occipital pole. So in the occipital polar reactions like uh, the, the tumors, we will not get the macular sparing. So we discussed the left temporal field represented the right occipital cortex, the right temporal field in the left occipital cortex. The P100, the most important component of the visual potentials are generated in the right and the periphery occipital cortex. There are two types of visual work potentials. One is the pattern reversal visual work potentials, and the one is the field clash of visual responses. The pattern reversal visual responses is the contrast luminance acts as a visual uh, stimulus, and then the action potentials are generated from the retinal nerve fiber layer. So most consistent and reliable, it stimulates the maxilla and also represents the central vision used almost all in neurology, neurophysiology laboratories. This is a typical example where they the one meter in the front distance when the alternative checkerboard patterns are used. So three scalp electrodes are applied. One is median, nasion, and the other one is the vertex. And we, before we apply, we have check the impedance of the electrodes. And there will be a continuous averaging of the more than 1,000 responses has been recorded and then visible. The test is with thematic representation. This is from the occipital cortex, and this is acting as a reference and uh, this is a ground electrode. This is a simple machine, which we record through the visual level potentials. Flash evoked responses, which largely stimulate at the periphery of the retina. It's useful in certain clinical conditions we'll talk about, and then it's inconsistent. Unfortunately, it's not reproducible. So the pattern reversal visual level potentials are most reliable and reproducible and always consistent. The flash evoked responses will create the function of the visual pathway is integrity or not. When someone has got a very poor visual acuity, they cannot cooperate, they cannot look at the visual, slab, the checkerboard pattern. As you see in newborns and young children, comatose patients and also in particle blindness. It has a wide variability. The latency differs from the P100, from 100 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds. So it's in general, the presence of uh, flash work responses indicates there is a, some anatomical integrity, whereas the absence of work potentials indicate complete interruption of the anti revision pathways. Not only the stimulus factors are also responsible for the good visual work potentials. The pattern, the field size, whether you change it in smaller and bigger squares, 
distance at which the patients are seated, contrast, luminance, and then rate of reversal. And the pupil the size also has the factors including the measurable potentials, age, alertness. If they're so drowsy and sleepy, you cannot get a good pattern reversal with your potentials. Sedation and anesthesia abolishes the visual potentials. So how do you diagnose? There are two criteria to be used. One is a latency criteria, another one is an amplitude criteria. The latency criteria is there is more than three standard deviations from the normative data. For example, in P100, if you take it as a P100, 115 milliseconds is considered as up to the normal range. Beyond 115 milliseconds to 120 is considered as borderline abnormalities. Beyond 120 is definitely abnormal. And the amplitude criteria, as you know that when there is an oxonal loss, the amplitude will be smaller. So P100 latency for our lab, or most of the lab, we derive this normative data from the normal controls, age and sex mesh controls, and three standard deviation slice like this. So 115 to 120 milliseconds is considered as borderline. More than 120 seconds is definitely abnormal. Not only that, the inter-eye latency between the one eye and the another eye is also considered to be abnormal if it is prolonged for more than 15 milliseconds between the inter-eye latency. For example, if the right eye is 100, the left eye is 115, the left eye is considered to be an optical neuropathy. The amplitude, generally, if it is less than 4.5 microvolts, it's indicating oxonal loss. So monoocular field is an abnormality seen on the, before the eye, the lesion should be in the anterior to the optic asthma, as we all know, beyond the chiasm, the decussage, and then the fibrous decussage. The EP is normal in unilateral lesion of the optic chiasm with monoocular stimulation because the E-cell projects into the uh, occipital lobes. So the P100 abnormalities, as we discussed earlier, that there could be two types of abnormalities. One is a delay in latency, another one is increase in amplitude. All the demyelinating optic neuropathies will cause a delay in, in, in P100 latency because the myelin is important for the conduction. When the myelin is delayed, the conduction is slow. So that's why we get a prolongation of the P100 latency. Not all P100 latencies are demyelinating optic neuropathy. There could be something uh, borderline abnormalities we all find in these conditions, the toxic amblyopia by alcohol and tobacco, and the vitamin B12 deficiency, anti discount optic neuropathy, parkoidosis, and lebus optic atrophy, and then some hereditary conditions like adrenal and the non adrenal lipodystrophy, Charcot Marie Tooth disease, Rodrix ataxia, and hereditary spastic paraplegia. The amplitude reduction, loss of uh, motor responses, uh, loss of visual evoke responses, decrease in the visual amplitude is usually seen in traumatic optic neuropathy. And then the poor visual acuity also in, indicates that could be a uh, amplitude reduction. That's uh, commonly we see in cataract, especially the mature cataract, and the retinal degeneration, severe refractory errors, and maculopathies also. VEPs are most useful in optic nerve function, but uh, the first in retrochiasmic lesion, the MRI is going to be of more useful interest. In hysterical and malingering, and also in particle blindness, normal wave and latency almost explodes the diagnosis of hysteria and the particle hysteria and the malingering. So I'll just show you some examples. This is the first visual liver potentials. Tracy Berry, uh, you can see that the P100 latency is 101 and the amplitude is 13. So this is normal waveforms. This is another patient who had a, a Tracy Berry that the uh, P100 latency is 100 milliseconds and the amplitude is also normal. So I will report this as a normal. Clinical opinion is normal anterior visual pulpitis of function, and there is no evidence of optic neuropathy in either eyes. This is another example you can easily interpret. So look at the mid occipital, and then the P100 latency is 115 milliseconds. 115 milliseconds, the amplitude of the N75 P100 is normal. This is the right eye and this is the left eye. The P100 latency is 117 milliseconds and the amplitude is normal. I would report as upper limit of normal range or borderline delay to indicate here, yeah, probably within normal limits or it could be a mild optic neuropathy. It has to be interpreted in the clinical context. The third example, uh, the P100 latency is markedly delayed to 133 milliseconds, well-preserved amplitude indicating a demyelinating optic neuropathy in the right eye. The left eye is also delayed to 135 and the amplitude is normal. So we conclude the prolonged latency in both eyes, bilateral, and indicating probably a demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis.
So to control the visual aware potentials, the pattern reversal visual aware potentials are most important and sensitive diagnostic tool in diagnosing the optic neuropathies. As I told you earlier, the myelin is uh, damaged, so that's why demyelination is happening. The P100 latency will be delayed with the well-preserved amplitude. Flash work responses are limited value, but it does have certain clinical indications like uncooperative patients, sleepy, drowsy, elderly patients or children where we can use a good laboratory with a trained technician and an experience of neurologists of most importance. So we'll move on to the next set of topics, the repetitive nerve test and then single fiber EMG. The neuromuscular junction is very interesting and rewarding. It's an immune mediator. It could be a paraneoplastic, toxic and congenital. It predominantly affects the muscles, but not the visual acuity. The bulbar and trough will involve. You do have two things. One is a presynaptic, another one is a postsynaptic. This is a, a simple schematic representation of the neuromuscular junction. It's showing acetylcholine, uh, the presynaptic vesicles, where acetylcholine will be stored in the synaptic vesicle. And then when the calcium stimulus comes, the calcium is released, and the acetylcholine released, and the acetylcholine binds to the in the separate of the post-synaptic membrane and then initiate the muscular action. How do you approach a simple patient who had a bilateral process? Clinical examination is important. You just ask them whether they do have a, a fatigability, diurnal variation, symmetrical or asymmetrical. We do the tensile test. Unfortunately, heterophone in the tensile is not available in India. So we do the modified new treatment test, take one ml and dilute it with the 10 ml of homicillin and inject through IV. The ECG monitoring to make sure that they don't have bradycardia. Ice pack test commonly done in the outpatient department itself. And of course, the acetylcholine is a an antibody and coming to the neurophysiology. Do the neurophysiology, we see nerve conduction, mimickers of the oxygen, like Gulen Barry syndrome, Fisher syndrome, mitochondrial cytopathies, MILAS, MERAP syndrome, like that. The repetitive. Do have a role, and then we we'll talk a little bit more on single fiber EMG in selected cases. It's an electrical correlated fatigue syndrome. It's a repetitive nerve system. Thus, the repetitive nerve stimulus and exhaust the aspect, and the electrically and then you recorded the all about the basic physiology. We use a low frequency test, one and three hertz, so that they uh, can test the neurological junction problem. Weak muscle yields a better result. Proximal muscle is the best result. So we do it the accessory nerve, the nerve, and then the distal nerves like the medial nerve, and the facial muscles in the arbitrary ocular and mesonalis. Distal muscle also we do it with a minimum by the ulnar nerve, the better policy is by the the standard protocol. And then the positive find returning towards the baseline. Look at this, this is a beautiful. Uh, decremental response, the third and fourth response, uh, fourth and fifth response is slowly down, low amplitude, and then it will slightly increase. This is a repair of the decremental characteristic shape or D shape phenomena. This is the same patient, and at the proximal, again, see that uh, clearly a decremental and then slowly uh, towards the ninth and tenth to move. So when you saw Decremental response is anything drop in amplitude of more than 10% between the first response to the fifth response is considered as positive decremental response. The decremental response has to be consistent and reproducible. All the nerves tested, proximal nerves, distal nerves, or distal muscles, proximal muscles, and also in the cranial nerve. So we do have a standard protocol. Baseline we do it, and then we 10 seconds isometric contraction, one minute post exercise to see if there's any facilitation in the neuromuscular junction. And then minutely intervals up to three to four minutes. So, can you conclude? It's more than 13 minutes. Okay, so just continue. So, three minutes plus. Yeah. First, RN is the baseline is stable, the decrement is reproducible, does it repair after the 10 seconds? So, few slides about the simple EMG the measuring of the variation of the interpotential interval. It does have a special electrode. I've written the review article in the Annals of Indian Academy of Neurology, also in the series on week. It's a gold, uh, it's a gold needle. So we use this for the recording of the single muscle action potential from this model. Variation in the interval is considered as a jitter. So we measure the variation by using the special needle electrode. And then you could see that uh, no muscle, zero muscle is variation in this group. And you could see the delayed 
neuromuscular junction. This is called jitter. And then when there is a weakness, you have failure of neuromuscular transmission that is called jitter, which is blocking. This is an abnormal. You can overlap with 100 tracings and then it's called delayed or uh, uh, jitter with blocking. So advantages of the single fiber EMG, unfortunately, you need a diagnosis. You can make a diagnosis very quickly. Normal single fiber EMG improves the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. So to conclude my talk, the myasthenia and myasthenic syndrome remains a clinical diagnosis. Antibody titers are of most of importance. Neurophysiology is supportive, but not in all the cases. Repetitive stimulation is crucial, and to uh, produce protocol has to be followed on single fiber EMG in selected cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arul, for so much of information <clears throat> which we may not have uh, got otherwise. Thank you very much for being with us all through the webinar also. Uh, shall we conclude, Dr. Jyoti? Yeah, I think that's fine. One quick question, I think, for the panelists regarding the optic disc edema. This is uh, something which I guess postgraduates would be interested to know. How do you actually measure the disc elevation using a direct op ophthalmoscope. So this is something which would be asked to them in the practical. So anybody would want, Dr. Mahesh would want to take this question. Yeah, the more, uh, the more traditional way is to use a direct ophthalmoscope uh, with uh, initially concentrating on the uh, base of the optic disc and then gradually increasing the dioptric power to the apex of the disc. Uh, as we go on increasing the dioptric power, uh, we calculate the number of uh, dioptric increase and. Uh, roughly calculate the uh, elevation of the optic disc. That is one of the more traditional way, but of course the most the stereoscopic ways are uh, uh, newer methods. That's true, but sometimes questions asked for the postgraduate during uh, yeah. uh, practicals is very common. Yeah, yeah, I think yes, Dr. We can conclude, no problem. Any, 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 any panelists, any speakers want to make comments or? Uh... I have one comment. Yes. I just had a comment on the initial uh, talk on the monocular double vision. Just for the postgraduates, one point, it is related with pinhole. So uh, uh, meaning that it is a, a disorder of the uh, refractive media. So that one test is extremely important uh, to exclude a monocular double vision. Yes, yes. That's Thank a point for the postgraduates. Yes, yes. Very relevant. So I think uh, uh, it has been an amazing webinar with the great speakers who are, and also backed with truly expert panel and very great moderating by Dr. Jyoti, which, uh, which has helped us get through all the essential things which a postgraduate needs to know in neuro-ophthalmology. Our thanks are due to the administrative staff of AOS under the guidance of Mr. Kripal, our webinar admin, Mr. Sunil, who uh, takes all the badgering which I keep giving and is so supportive all through the webinars. Uh, Sai and Manjula from Numerotech for their support. My own dear ARC colleagues who have been conspicuously absent today. And of course, our dear attendees who infuse so much energy that uh, we are always on the urge to deliver our best uh, on behalf of ARC. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Dr.